All right, Psalm 69. To the chief musician set to the lilies, a psalm of David. Uh, Save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. I sink in deep mire. Where there is no standing, I have come into deep waters where the floods overflow me. I am weary with my crying, my throat is dry. My eyes fail while I wait for my God. Those who hate me without a cause are more than the hairs of my head. They are mighty who would destroy me, being my enemies wrongfully. Though I have stolen nothing, I still must restore it. O God, you know my foolishness and my sins are not hidden from you. Let not those who wait for you, O Lord, God of hosts, be ashamed because of me. Let not those who seek you be confounded because of me, O God of Israel. Because for your sake I have borne reproach. Shame has covered my face. I have become a stranger to my brothers and an alien to my mother's children. Because zeal for your house has eaten me up, and the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me. When I wept and chastened my soul with fasting, that became my reproach. I also made sackcloth my garment. I became a byword to them, those who sit in the gate and speak against me, and I am the song of the drunkards. Now, going through the Psalms and and coming across uh, 69, this Psalm of David, and you may be reading through it a while before you really recognize, aha, this is, this is prophetic of Jesus Christ in the New Testament. When you get down to verse 9, and you will recall the time when Jesus, he actually he did it twice. In the beginning of the ministry, John records that Jesus comes into the, to the temple, to the house of God, and in the courtyard was the exchanging of the, from the Roman money into the temple uh, currency or the temple shekel, and then there also was the exchange or you could purchase your sacrifices uh, for a for a convenience fee right there at the temple and you could buy a pre-approved pre-inspected sacrifice now turns out as you understand that that the, the the verse that the Holy Spirit inspired New Testament writers when they're talking about the gospel they reference verse 9 as because zeal for your house has eaten me up and then you you start to examine this psalm a little bit and you're like David's low. If you you come into this place, he's talking about sinking in the mire. He's talking about about the depths and and various ways of speaking of the the um, the experience of life when he's saying, I'm weary with my crying. Those who hate me without a cause. This this expression, and you look into 6, those uh, um, 6 and 7, he talks about those uh, who, who trust in the Lord would not be ashamed because of him and his life and the reproach and, and all this description. And now when you look at this and you, and you spend some time with the Lord over this, wh- where's this at today? Where, where is the heart that goes deeply into the sorrows of life and finds God there? Where's the heart that through the, the circumstances of life, through the experiences, and, and you'll even see that though I've, I've stolen nothing, I must restore it. And along comes, you know, this prophetic psalm, and if you look at it closely, it probably describes more clearly than maybe any other place in Scripture when it says that Jesus Christ was a man of sorrows and he was acquainted with grief. Now certainly you have the prophetic in Isaiah 52, 53 of his being the sacrifice for sin. And the Bible, the New Testament, is silent between the ages of 12 and 30 with Jesus. And we know that then he comes onto the scene and he's baptized by John. And, and when you look at this life of Christ and then, and then, he, and then Christ comes to suffer, he suffers in the flesh, and he, he bears the reproach. He bears the iniquity of the world. And you start to examine that this psalm then being prophetic and, and how he lives his life and, and how, how he was with fasting. And, and again, he taught to do that privately, and you know that he, he did these things and the reproach that fell upon him and the various things, and taking a stand against the scribes and the Pharisees and, and just the, the plain old laying down of life. Now, when I say it in that context, you say, okay, I get it. I can, I can see Jesus. I can see the prophecies. I can see, and now we're going to, it's like, it's like pulling out your can opener when you realize that, that, that Psalm 69 contains the prophetic sufferings of Christ in his 
life. And then you open up the can and now you start to, you can look at the, the sufferings of Christ and then you can understand, okay, that's, that's Jesus Christ. And now I'm going to take it a step further for you. As you open up the can and you open up the New Testament and you open up your heart and you, and you start to say, okay, so I see that we've been called by God into Christ Jesus. Through faith in Christ Jesus, that, that salvation that he won on the cross, the, the sufferings that he bore on the cross and leading up to the cross, the sufferings of, of the garden and the sufferings of, of laying down life and get this, the suffering of always saying no to sin. Right? So whenever temptation came, he, he suffered and said no to sin. Now, when we apply that the words of those that follow Jesus Christ. You know, think about the Holy Spirit inspired Peter and, and what Peter wrote down. And, and you, can, you can read through 1 Peter and by the time you get to 1 Peter and, and you're getting into this and you get to chapter 3 and then he says it in chapter 3 and then he says it in chapter 4 and he says it again in chapter 5. Well, what is it that he says in 3, 4, and 5? He describes a life of being a, a, a partaker, a fellow partaker of the sufferings of Jesus Christ. Now, this life is not to be foreign from believers. In fact, Jesus warned his apostles and encouraged them at the same time. Don't be surprised when the world hates you. It hated me first. Now, when the sufferings of Christ are so foreign to your Christian life, it's time to examine your Christian life. When you partake of the sufferings of Christ and you understand that, that I, I'm not going to sin, and you say, deny self, take up your cross, follow Jesus Christ. And then, you know, so Psalm 69 now, after you pull out that can opener and you understand it's about Christ, well, guess what? Christ lives within. And to the extent that the Apostle Peter was communicating, you're a partaker of his death, being freed from sin, you're a partaker of his life, being resurrected from the dead, and you're a partaker now now, as the life of Christ in you of the sufferings in this world. Saying no to sin, saying no to Satan, saying no to the flesh, saying no to self, and just plain old living and doing the right thing when you're reading the scriptures and, and you must obey the scriptures and, and zeal for your house has eaten me up. And more so, we can kind of skate through this life, never partaking of the sufferings of Christ, and just kind of skimming the, the surface of what it is to be a Christian and, and always remaining shallow instead of saying, you know what, Lord, what I find in your word, and when I, when I wait upon you and I'm alone with you and you write this word on my heart and, and with the, the power and help of the Holy Spirit that I would do it. Now, find it strange what I say next to you? One of the most difficult things that I have found to do in, in partaking of the sufferings of Christ is to deny everything else and simply to wait upon God alone and pray and, and just wait there for the Lord and to, to, to hear from Him no matter how long that takes. Now, when Paul describes that life that he had that followed Christ, he talks about sleeplessness and fastings and prayers and peril and all the places that Paul went, he suffered in this life and, and being shipwrecked and then being beat and then imprisoned. And sometimes that life can be a million miles away from our cozy little um, church building Christianities that we, we need to take to heart. Now, back to 13, 69, 13, because we've got to keep going a little bit here tonight. So, n by no means can I expound on every verse. It's, it's impossible at this pace. 69, 13 says, But as for me, my prayer is to you, O Lord, in the acceptable time, O God, in the multitude of your mercy, hear me in the truth of your salvation. Deliver me out of the mire, and let me not sink. Let me be delivered from those who hate me, and out of the deep waters, let not the flood water overflow me, nor let the deep swallow me up, and let not the pit shut its mouth on me. Hear me, O Lord, for your loving kindness is good. Turn to me according to the multitude of your tender mercies, and do not hide your face from your servant, for I am in trouble. Hear me speedily, draw near to my soul, and redeem it. Deliver me because of my enemies. Now, I'll pause right there um, simply to say this. I much rather prefer when I come to services that I know how things are going to go. 
But if you stop to really think about that, you know, I spend some time reading and studying and then we're preparing a worship set and then I'm asking, uh, you know, two individuals to do testimonies. Well, I asked the two who shared testimony tonight before the Bible study, I asked um, Marty and I asked Joseph to share their testimonies last week. Well, I wanted them to share their testimonies because I knew we were planning on getting through Psalm 69 last week. And so then, neither one of them, like Joseph's like, yeah, I'm, I'm not sharing my testimony this week, and then Marty couldn't make it last week because, because work got in the way, you know. And um, the realities are, and you, you read through this section, and, and the depths of heart where no man can touch you, where, you know, I, I know 10 years of backsliding. I wouldn't listen to a human being because and, and, I wasn't listening to God. I wasn't going to listen to a person. And it's in this depth of heart that, that only you can experience. And, and David writes about that in 13 through 18. And it is in the depths of heart where, where you, you find yourself in the throes of either sin or, or in the throes of, of suffering from somebody else's sin. And then you realize that you're just crying out to the Lord. And, and the bottom line answer is what we heard tonight by testimony, that through prayer, God is there. And there is a power of God and that the Holy Spirit is real and genuine. The Spirit comes and lives within and that the Spirit of Christ is to be in the church today and it's to be very much that he would draw us into Christ and that the power of God, the Spirit of Christ within us to live after Christ. And, and just, you think it's easy. You think that, oh, what is he talking about up front tonight? Just, just do this. <coughs> Take tomorrow. Right? You start tonight. I mean, you, you got some practice. You, you maybe be up for a few more hours after study. But just try not to sin. In, in attitude, in, in action, in thought, word, indeed. Just try not to get angry, upset. Just try not to sin. And just try to strive against sin like Hebrews talks about. And, and just see just how much you're like, oh. And, and very quickly you'll realize that, that there's a, a great force at work. Now, I had no intention of sinning today. I didn't want to sin. I was even aware of it and spending time. And yet, lo and behold, just all from within, too. All from within and just right there in my heart. So, is God there? Well, and here it is with David, as David writes this, and, and when you experience the sufferings of Christ, David comes before and suffers in this life, and Holy Spirit prophetic, writing these things down, and it's an example of that which is actually about Jesus Christ, that now we look back, and we look at all the sufferings of Christ, and do we say, those also should be mine? Or do we say, um, I seek to save my life from those sufferings. Now let the words of Christ sink down. He says, if any man would come after me, if any man would follow me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For he who seeks to save his life in this world will lose it, but he who loses his life will find it. And my whole encouragement to you is this, just lose your life for Christ. Let, let come that may come, and if he takes you through the depths of suffering, and this is your testimony and experience, then let God be glorified when you're slighted. So when, when you have to repay something you didn't do and, and you're to forgive, let those sufferings fall upon Christ in you. Do not hide your face from me. Back, back to 17, for I'm in trouble. 18, draw near to my soul and redeem it. Now that takes some time, doesn't it? I have a, a very much a clear testimony of the time that it takes for me to draw near to God in my, in my inner chamber. I can't rush in, I can't rush out. Now, I do rush in and I do rush out, and then what's that testimony? When I rush in and I rush out, I haven't hardly drew near. But when I'm in trouble, things change, don't they? You wouldn't believe how my wife and I, how our prayer life increased through sleepless nights of pain that she was experiencing and how much like crying out to the Lord over and over. And, and there are seasons and there are things that happen. Now 19 says, you know my reproach, my shame and my dishonor, my adversaries are all before you. Reproach has broken my heart and I am full of heaviness. I looked for someone to take pity, but there was none. And for comforters, but I found none. They also gave me gall for my food, and for my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. 
Now immediately, if you spent any time in the New Testament, you're like, that's Jesus on the cross. And so David's experiencing the pain and suffering, and the Holy Spirit's writing this down. And so when Christ has experienced the sufferings of the cross, and he says, follow me, and he says, this is love. By this you know love, right? Christ laid his life down for you. You also ought to lay down your life for one another. So what's our expectation when we say, I will love as Christ loved? Because isn't, isn't that New Testament, you know, straight in front? Um, by this, all men will know you are dis my disciples. By your hot dish that you have at your potlucks. No. <laughs> You'll know you're my disciples by the love that you have for one another. And does that love hurt? You know, and I think that's probably, if, if there's any place where I ever would turn away, it would be that I would turn away because of the pain of laying down life. And why do we, why do we seek to take our lives up before, because maybe it won't hurt as much this time. But loving as Jesus loved, and get this one, forgiving as he forgave costs. It costs everything. Vinegar for his thirst, that's Jesus, that's the cross. Let their table become a snare before them and their well-being a trap. Let their eyes be darkened so they do not see and make their loins shake continually. Pour out your indignation upon them and let your wrathful anger take hold of them. Now, I get this, but I don't get it. When I, when I say, and, and again, just talking with various Christians and, and, and spending some time and listening to, and, and we're more infected with a non-Christ-like attitude as Christians than we ought to be. What do I mean? We're soft. We're soft upon evil and wickedness, and we're soft, and we're like, and so we're more accepting of wickedness and evil than we are to take a stand upon things. So today, right, these six things, the, yes, these seven are an abomination to the Lord, a proud look, a lying tongue. And you go through that list in the proverb, and you're like, do I really hate do I really just cry out to God, destroy evil, deliver me from the evil one? Or, or do we like to have anger around because it serves its purpose to get things done from time to time? Or you, you see where this comes from. Do we really hate indignation and, and wrath and say, God, destroy these, this sin? And, and yes, the people who do them. Let their dwelling place be desolate. Let, let no one live in their tents. For they persecute the ones you have struck and talk of the grief of those you have wounded. Add iniquity there, to their iniquity and let them not come into your righteousness. Let them be blotted out of the book of the living and, let, and not be written with the righteous. But I am poor and sorrowful. Let your salvation, O God, set me up on high. And I will praise the name of God with a song and will magnify him with thanksgiving. Now, just as we talk about the love of Christ perfected in us, we're also talking about the truth, the spirit of truth, the spirit of Christ perfected in us. And that what, what do we know? And again, this I'll come back to this. I like to know what's going to happen before it happens in service. Yet, if we're really honest, what do we, what do we really in expectation would be this? We, we don't know exactly everything, so what do we do? We pray, we seek the Lord God, we don't know what to do. And, and you realize you get into all these situations and you, and you encounter sinful people and you're sharing the gospel and you're witnessing and you're seeking to live that way for Christ and then, and then you're in the throes of where, where the enemy's uh, doing warfare and then it comes into your personal life and, and this is the very depths of the heart. And, and David, when he's writing and he's talking, and, and you experience, you know, and we have the glimpse of the cross of Jesus Christ. And you would expect that possibly, just possibly, Jesus Christ on the cross, if there ever was a time that he could say, Father, blot their names out of the book of life, that that would have been the time he could have done it. Instead, he says, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. And when you let this depth sink into your heart of just the effects of sin in the world, we, we've become so complacent to the com for the complacency of fools, they'll be destroyed. So complacent, and I, I just, I, 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 where does any of this ever affect us anymore? Psalm 69, we read through it, oh, it's a nice psalm. No, it's not. It's not. It's, it's meant to affect in the depths of our heart and sorrow and experience and to cry out to the Lord and, and just really value that salvation that we've been granted. I am poor and sorrowful. Let your salvation, O God, set me on high. I will praise the name of God with a song and will magnify him with thanksgiving. This also shall please the Lord better than the ox or bull which has horns and hoofs. 
The humble shall see this and be glad, and you who seek God, your heart shall live. For the Lord hears the poor and does not despise his prisoners. Let heaven and earth praise him, the seas and everything that moves in them. For God will save Zion and build the cities of Judah that they may dwell there and possess it. Also the descendants of his servants shall inherit it, and those who love his name shall dwell in it. And that's yet future. Psalm 70, to the chief musician, a psalm of David, to bring remembrance. Now Jesus says, as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. You know, he gives us that which is he uh, gave for a reminder always of his death, uh, his, his suffering and his death to set us free. The, the redemption, the, the body broken, the bloodshed. And when he, uh, he gives that remembrance, now David writes a remembrance. And in much way to serve the same purpose. Not to get saved all over again. In fact, if you crucify Christ many times, right, you violate the book of Hebrews. Because the book of Hebrews is very clear that it says what? That there is one sacrifice for sin. And if you seek that, you would crucify Christ over and over again. You would thus, therefore, say, well, that what he did on the cross didn't really work. So we have to recreate that every time. So it's a remembrance. And when David writes this, you look at his remembrance. He says he's going to remember God's deliverance. Make haste, O God, to deliver me. Make haste to help me, O God. Now, doesn't a testimony serve a great purpose of remembrance? When you remember when you were in the depths and Satan had the chokehold on you and, and he had you bound and he's lying to you and, 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 and even if you couldn't describe it to Satan and you say, wow, my, my flesh really wants to do these wicked things. And it is helpful now to remember what did rescue you. Well, Jesus Christ, the blood of Jesus Christ bought my freedom, set me free. So make haste to deliver me, O God. Help me. Let them be ashamed and confounded who seek my life. Let them be turned back and confused who desire my hurt. Now, we're not even willing to, to admit this one glaring issue is the sin of one person upon another. Just how many people are sinned against from their youth forward. And just the sin that happens upon mankind, it's no different than what David is remembering here when those who are sinning against another seeking their hurt. Let them be turned back because of their shame who say, aha, aha. Let all those who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. Let those who love your salvation say continually, let God be magnified. So there's always a hint in our worship and our, and our praise of the salvation of what God has done. The remembrance always brings about what you were saved from and how you received that, that you might give thanks and praise to God. And he ends in five with, but I am poor and needy. Make haste to help me, O God. You are my help and my deliverer. Oh Lord, do not delay. So when you're in trouble and he's rescued me in the past and then you know that this is the way to live and yet when you're back in trouble again, can you call out to the Lord once again? And of course that answer is yes. Now 71. In you, O oh Lord, I put my trust. Let me never be put to shame. Deliver me in your righteousness and cause me to escape. Incline your ear to me and save me. Be my strong refuge to which I may resort continually. You have given the commandment to save me, for you are my rock and my fortress. Deliver me, O oh my God, out of the hand of the wicked, out of the hand of the unrighteous and cruel man, for you are my hope, O oh Lord God. You are my trust from my youth." But you, by you, I have been upheld from birth. You are he who took me out of my mother's womb. My praise shall continue, be continually of you. I have become as a wonder to many, but you are my strong refuge. Let my mouth be filled with your praise and with your glory all the day. Do not cast me off in the time of old age, nor do not forsake me when my strength fails. For my enemies speak against me, and those who lie in wait for my life take counsel together, saying, God has forsaken him. Pursue and take him, for there is none to deliver him. O oh God, do not be far from me. O oh my God, make haste to help me. Let them be confounded and consumed who are adversaries of my life. 
Let them be covered with reproach and dishonor who seek my hurt. Now, much has been done to lie to the church by the one who came to kill, steal, and destroy, the father of all lies. When Jesus came, there was a whole religious system that was built upon the lies that Satan had worked into Judaism. And all the various lies and all the various traditions of man and the various things that, that they could not judge righteously or would not judge righteously. And so even that system that Jesus cast out, saying, you've made my, my father's house, house a den of thieves. And turns out that the high priest was in on that and they were getting rid and they were over that whole buying and selling. And when you, when you get to this whole thing, and, and so much has been done in our modern world to downplay the existence of the one who would destroy you if he could and seek to downplay the, the warfare that we're constantly in and sleepiness settles into the church. I get up in the morning, I shave or don't shave, eat breakfast, take a shower or don't shower, and I go to work, and I go to work, and I put into this, and, and it becomes just lulled into this sleepiness, and next thing you know, Monday through Friday is gone, and all of a sudden you're on day six in the month, and then the month is half over, and it just, it's like this endless cycle, and we're more like the book of Ecclesiastes than we are like the book of Acts. Living more under the S-U-N instead of under the S-O-N and understanding and realizing that when we have this life of Christ within us and, and it, it's, not that, it's not that Satan even has to do much anymore just to get you sleepy and just kind of get you off into something. And, and this whole thing that would we really, would we really take to heart? Because we're going to get into this tonight, but we get through 72, and here we're in 71, and if you, you could lay right now, right over top of this, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, power, and the glory. Now in, in this context of the Psalms and the depths, uh, I can't really uh, just say that Jesus, you know, said, you know, God didn't sin and then said, you know, confessed, you know, and he didn't sin. Right? He didn't confess. He taught how to pray that way for those that would follow after him. And it wasn't just say this prayer, like two aspirin, take two of these, and you're better in the morning. No, if you actually start to examine and you look at the Psalms and David, prophetic of Jesus, and you realize this, that, that deliver us from the evil one. And just how present sin is with us who desires to do good. How the flesh is constantly with us is at enmity with God and how much we need to be led by the Spirit and that there is an enemy and that we, we take to heart, are you even active? Are you awake first and foremost, right? Watch and pray lest you enter temptation. So the sleepiness invites temptation and then it's like, well, it's just the way it is. And then you end up saying it, well, it's, it is what it is and then you just go on and, and yet not realizing that you, you just left the battle. You just, you just left the warfare. You just took the sword of the Spirit, set it down. You, you put it behind your back. You just took prayer, folded it up, put it in the corner, and you'll pick it up once in a while when the pastor says, I can't believe he's always saying, come pray, come pray. What is, who is he to always say, come pray? And, and guys, I, I have the warfare to get into my inner chamber like you do. And, and when you understand this warfare that's existing and you read Psalm 71 and there is someone right there who is very acquainted with the enemy. You say, oh, I get it. So Jeho in Jehoshaphat's day, they're surrounded by Moab and the Ammonites. Those enemies of God that, that tried to kill them when they were coming into the wilderness, now hundreds of years later, eight or nine hundred years later, and now they're coming to attack again and they're surrounding it and there's a real enemy in his day and they come and they cry out to the Lord. There's a real enemy in Hezekiah's day. There's a real enemy in David's day and David's acquainted with enemies and yet today the church would say, well, we don't have any enemies. And, and continually just watching Satan just kind of go around the outside and just launch lies in. And then you start having conferences built upon lies and things contrary to the scriptures. And now we would experience, maybe we need Jesus, the, the, the whip, you know, braiding Jesus that comes in and just, just cleanses our hearts and, and say, you know, there's, there's things that got to go and there has to be a separation. And where's the holiness? And where's, where's 
the church that's well acquainted with the enemy. Oh, not to love the enemy, but, but knows his tactics. But examine Psalm 71 and there's and this choice and decision. I'm going to serve Christ and I'm going to put idols away and this is going to go and I'm going to pray and I'm going to understand this warfare. I'm going to look at the people around me and I'm going to see there's a warfare for his soul. There's a warfare for her soul and she's right before me. And there's a warfare for serving God and there's a warfare for, for what do you do in the kingdom of God and what's the fruitfulness of the church. And, and is it really that, that there is a power to be realized in prayer? Is there, is there any prayers like Jesus prayed? And so when he's praying all night long, I, I, he's not just saying our Father, you know, so you can, say, you can pray it every 10 seconds. You know, he's not praying it 16,000 times a night. He's getting alone with the Father and he's waiting upon him and he's, he's really considering the will of God. He's considering the kingdom of God. He's considering deliver us from the evil one. And, and these are the things that, that, that are there. Now, as I pause there, now let's pick it up in 14, right where I left off. But I will hope continually and praise you yet more and more. My mouth shall tell of your righteousness and your salvation all, day, all the day, for I do not know their limits. I will go in the strength of the Lord God, and I will make mention of your righteousness of yours only. Now, when you're well acquainted with the enemy and you turn away from the enemy and you're fighting against the enemy and, you, and even the life of Christ in you, not to let that deteriorate and, and, and then just how important worship is and how important hope is. You know, Satan just wants you to go to sleep and lets you think that the resurrection, yes, it happened. Yes, we really believe it happened, but it has no reality for you that Jesus actually rose from the dead and that Jesus Christ is coming back and that, and that all this is going to take place and that there's to be a hope. And so you realize that when you're well acquainted with the enemy and, and you're well acquainted with this hope and, and praise and worship, just how important that is, and what do you do with your mouth? You know, what do I do with my mouth? Do I just open my mouth to chew people up and spit them out? Or do I, do I open my mouth to praise God? And do I op open my mouth to glorify God and to praise and to speak of his salvation all the day? Yeah, what kind, where are those Christians at who are active in the, in the warfare? And um, I think you get my point tonight. I will go in the strength of the Lord God, Isaiah 40, 31. Those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Now, how do you wait upon the Lord? Well, the best I got, the best I can come up with that is you wait upon the Lord in prayer. When Jesus did not know what to do, right, he would go to the Father and he would pray and he would know exactly what to do after spending the night with the Father in prayer. When you don't know what to do and, or, or you know, worse yet, when you know what to do. Yeah, I got this covered. I just, I just keep going like I'm going and just do this and do that. And next thing you know, you're just in a routine and, and all of a sudden the life of Christ is gone. I will go in the strength of the Lord God. Well, what's this? 2 Corinthians 12, 9 says that what my strength, his strength is made perfect in my weakness. His grace is sufficient. So you start to apply this and you look at these things and I will make mention of your righteousness of yours only. And this is the life of waiting upon the Lord and to be strengthened by the Lord God to go and do what you know to do. To go and be the witness, the power of the Spirit of God uh, upon you to be a witness of Jesus Christ. To go and live and to serve and look at the souls all around you and to actively be praying and power and waiting upon God and expecting that you can go forth in the strength of the Lord. Now when it's a small group and we're few in number and time passes, it's easy to grow weary. And so then some people, some teachers think that we need to just, you know, we need to hold conferences about being weary and discouraged. And I, I don't want to even hear about another conference about being weary and discouraged. But I, want, I do want to hear about the life of Christ that we would be stirred in power to love God with our whole heart, to love our neighbor as ourself, and to get on with obedience, to get on with walking in these things and to wait upon the Lord till our strength is renewed. Oh God, you have taught me from, from my youth 
To this day, I declare your wondrous works. So John, the, probably the last epistles that are written, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. He's the last apostle alive, and he writes these things, and he talks to fathers, he talks to, to young men, and he talks to children. And then it's in there twice, he talks to them and, and imparts to them. And this psalmist also declares here, knowing the Lord from across life, you know, from, from youth and now when I'm old. To this day, I declare your wondrous works. Now also, when I am old and gray-headed, I retire, and I go to a beach, and I put my feet up, and I enjoy the rest of my life because I earned it. Now, that's the world, but should that be the church? So you look at David, and he says, Now when I am old and gray-headed, O oh God, do not forsake me until I declare your strength to this generation. You know what's lost? There's a lot that's been lost that hasn't been handed down. So here we are in more of a recovery mode because what's lost is where's prevailing prayer? So I have to leapfrog over about three generations to get back to a group of guys who wrote and believed and taught that there was to be this prevailing prayer, that you prayed until the Lord answered it. Maybe, maybe we got money and then we didn't need to pray as much. You know, what was that church of Laodicea? They are, they're rich, they have need of nothing, and didn't know their state. Well, I'm just going to say, the church is in a low spiritual state, so now, as individual believers, we gotta, we got to recapture all these things, and go listen to the past generations. They passed something down. This, this, David declares it here. He says, until I declare your strength to this generation, your power to everyone who is to come. Also, your righteousness, O God, is very high. You have done great things. O God, who is like you? You who have shown me great and severe troubles shall revive me again and bring me up again from the depths of the earth. You shall increase my greatness and comfort me on every side. Also with the lute, I will praise you. And your faithfulness, O my God, to you I will sing with, with the harp, O Holy One of Israel. My lips shall greatly rejoice when I sing to you my soul which you have redeemed. My tongue also shall take of your, talk of your righteousness all the day long. For they are confounded, for they are brought to shame who seek my hurt. Now, one more psalm to get through here, but before we move on. Would you have any worship in your life if I canceled that time of worship before the Bible study? Would you have, would you revolt and say, where is the praise, the corporate worship of the church? Or would you be perfectly happy? See, when you let this sink in and all this stuff, and just as I would, would exhort you and encourage you to be well acquainted with the warfare uh, of, of the enemy and his tactics, are you as much well acquainted with the importance and understanding from the second half of this psalm of what you have to pass on and the importance of praise and worship and you personally saying, I worship and praise God so that you would, there would be a revolt if I would say we're no longer doing worship. That you would stone me for saying why would you even take that away from us. But see what happens is most of the time we come to church and just say oh that's given to us, that's given to us and, and somebody's doing everything else for you and yet all I'm saying with the Psalms is everything that I'm reading when I'm reading through the Psalms and I come up here to say what I have to say is I'm realizing in this heart, this heart the word of God is just drawing me deeper into the Lord. And that used to being shallow is like there's parts now where God says, no, come, come deeper in this. And it takes time to spend time alone with the Lord. And do you give God personal worship? Do you just give him praise? Do you wake in the morning and if you have an instrument or, you know, great is your faithfulness and you meditate upon God's faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness, O God. And, and that shadows into lamentations. His mercies are new every morning. And, and where's the depth that you, you have from today? Because today was today and you only have today. And part of that day of today had to be for the Lord. To draw you deeper to know the Lord so that you could go forth into this life. Now, Psalm 72, right? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. This is thy kingdom come part. This, we talk about deliver us from evil. We talk about our Father in heaven. Hallowed be your name. If you just, you focus on hallowed be your name, you're going to be worshiping God. Well, thy kingdom come. What, what does the Bible have to say? Well, Psalm 72 says a psalm of Solomon. Unless you have the King James, it says a psalm for Solomon. How do I know David wrote it? Well, look at the last verse. The prayers of David, the son of Jesse, are ended. This is a psalm of David. It's for Solomon. Now, David knew that Solomon was to be king. 
Now, Adonijah almost, you know, doesn't end around and, or fl out, tries to outflank him and then, you know, the prophet and then together with Bathsheba and then Solomon is then put on the throne. And the promises of God came to David that David's descendants would be on the throne forever. Obviously, a messianic prophecy and, and Solomon's to be the one to fulfill it. And then now read this psalm in the correct context of which it was written and you'll see that, that David is going to write this for Solomon, but as he writes it for his son, the son of the king, King, whose son is he anyway, Jesus said. Well, the Messiah, whose son is he? Well, he's the son of David. Well, how then in the spirit does the, David, does the son, does, does David call his son Lord, referencing Psalm 110, and the Pharisees couldn't answer the question. Well, they wouldn't. Now, when you have this, now look at, look at thy kingdom come. Look at all the messianic kingdom here. Isaiah 60 through chapter 66. Just, if you read Isaiah 60, chapter 60 through 66, together with Psalm 72, this is an overwhelming good theme. Give the king your judgments, O God, and your righteousness to the king's son. What does Revelation say? Revelation says that true and righteous are your judgments, O Lord. He will judge your peoples with righteousness and your poor with justice. The mountains will bring peace to the people and the little hills by righteousness. He will bring justice to the poor of the people. He will save the children of the needy. He will break in pieces the oppressor. They shall fear you as long as the sun and moon endure. Throughout all generations, he shall come down like rain upon the grass before mowing, like showers that water the earth. In his days, the righteous shall flourish and abundance of peace until moon is no more. <coughs> now you've just, this psalm here shot right past Solomon all the way out to the kingdom age of the Messiah, the son of David, Jesus of Nazareth. And, and he's going to fulfill all these. He shall have dominion also from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. Now that's the Euphrates River. Those who dwell in the wilderness will bow before him and his enemies will lick the dust. The kings of Tarshish and of the isles. Now that's, that's a great study besides that because it's Tarshish was way out and then uh, the isles, again, probably starts to speak of even what we know of as Europe possibly even those that came from Europe. The, the kings of Tarshish and of the Isles will bring presents. The kings of Sheba and Seba will offer gifts. Well, that's over in Saudi Arabia. Sheba and Dedan. Yes, all kings shall fall down before him. All nations shall serve him. Now, a lot of people did come see Solomon. And what did Jesus say? Yet there is one greater than Solomon is here when he was on the earth. And you, you'll see this prophetic psalm. For he will deliver the needy when he cries, the poor also, and him who has no helper. He will spare the poor and needy and will save souls of the needy. He will redeem their life from oppression and violence and, and precious shall be their blood in his sight. And he shall live. And the gold of Sheba will be given to him. Prayer also will be made for him continually and daily he shall be praised. Now again, uh, Isaiah 60, 61, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me to preach the gospel to the poor. So Jesus came to do just that, and yet it's going to be ultimately fulfilled when he comes to rule and reign. 16, there, sh there will be an abundance of grain in the earth. On the top of the mountains, its fruit shall wave like Lebanon, and those of the city shall flourish like the grass of the earth. His name shall endure forever. His name shall continue as long as the sun, and men shall be blessed in him. All nations shall call him blessed. Blessed be the Lord God, the God of Israel, who only does wondrous things, and blessed be his glorious name forever, and let the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. The prayer, prayers of David, the son of Jesse, are ended. Now as we wrap it up right there tonight, let me make this simple encouragement to you. When I study the Psalms and I experience the lack that's within of the life of Christ, know this, that it doesn't come about by my efforts, doesn't come out by my flesh convincing myself that I need to pray, pray more. <coughs> Trust me, your flesh knows you need to pray more and then when you go after it in the flesh, it fails. 
But by the Spirit of God, let, let this just start to be this. By the Spirit, Lord, teach me. Do you come to the, the Word of God every day? Teach me, Lord, by your Spirit. Show me what's there. You know, do you, do you wipe the slate clean and say, God, speak to me today? Do you understand that all this, God, show me what to do? And what if, what if you're in Psalm 72 and the Lord that day is just like, you need to focus upon the coming kingdom of Christ. Do you pray, thy kingdom come, and then do you pray, come, Lord Jesus? Do you understand that all these things are written and that we are to see the blood of the, of the saints that have been shed? They're to be avenged. And so much more as you start to put this theme into your heart, what would God say to us every time we come? What would he say to you in the morning? Or are we just on cruise control? Sleepiness, you know, you don't have to be as attentive with the cruise control on. You can just go sleep. And, and uh, is there an enemy anymore? Is there an enemy who prowls about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour? Is there anyone? Is there, is there, is there a rise of false teachers? Is, I mean, you, you think about this. Everything Jesus said would be happening immediately before his return is happening now. And so the falling away, those no longer enduring sound doctrine, just heaping up teachers for themselves that scratch the itching ear. Let's us be a church that just hears Jesus say, let him who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says. When he says repent, what do you do? You repent. <clears throat> when he says go, what do you do? You go. When he says stop, you stop. When he says wait, you wait. And I believe we're sitting on something here, meaning this, not a stool, not a chair, is the Lord wants to use a church that will not be given over to the methods of man to make something appear to be happening is that the Lord will honor the church who waits upon him and, and goes forth in the strength and the power of God to preach the same gospel of Jesus Christ has always been preached and the power of God to be upon the gospel for people to be saved. And that God wants to save many and that God's desire is that all men would be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth and that there is a prevailing power in prayer to see these things come to pass. Yes, I want you to come and pray in all the corporate times in prayer. And even more so, I want you to learn to, to just simply apply having an inner chamber. And just, just foster that in 2016. You learn, if it takes you six months just, just beating the flesh and, and crying out to God to change your heart, that you would actually get to be able to that place where it's you and God alone and you're intimately in prayer with God to hear what he has to say and the Spirit of God is just teaching you the scriptures. And once again, you, you kick off the cruise control. You, you, can, you can get into this life and say, what is today about God? What do I need to do today? What's before me today? What's in your kingdom today? Who's before me that needs the gospel? How do I go forth and do good today? Who needs prayer today? And then all of a sudden, it's like, trust me, you'll meet the enemy then. An old, an old preacher once said to a, to a young preacher who was talking like I am tonight, came up and patted him on the head afterwards, and, oh, son, I've, I've been a pastor for, for 47 years. And the way you're talking about the enemy and said, I, the, Satan's just not like that anymore. What you read in the Bible, that stuff, Satan just doesn't do that stuff anymore like that. And the young man looked at his, I, and the, old, the old preacher said to him, I've never, I've never met Satan like that. And the young guy said to him, could it ever be that maybe you're going the same direction? That's why you've never crossed his path. So, what do you expect when you serve and love the Lord? Lazy boy living? Or do you expect to suffer in this life? Now, I don't think we should suffer just for suffering's sake. That's foolish. But when you suffer according to the will of God, and you do the will of God, and, and just you put that before you, if you just put one thing before you until you, until you get into the prayer closet, what is God's will for my life? You know, you may have to go back and reread the Psalms. I'm, I'm even tonight, I'm like, I didn't do him justice. I mean, we went so fast through them, like I couldn't even just go into what needs to go into, but you can, and I can, where? In the inner chamber.